a minute early or slightly early, but um, I wanted to get going this evening. As you can see behind me, my shelves are empty. Um, my instruments have been very heavily used lately and um, they're all in cases in my living room because they're in and out the house every day doing different jobs. Um, this last week in particular has been a bit mental, but all wonderful things. Last Monday I was at... Um, Oh, I should say my neighbour has decided to start doing some DIY. So if you can hear that in the background, I hope to God that it's not too loud and overpowering. Um, but if it is, let me know in the comments. So I might go and knock the door and ask him to stop for an hour. Um, yeah, so last Monday I was um, at a local folk club near Leicester, sort of between Leicester and Nottingham, um, Grand Union Folk Club with my trio Morai, which is me, Joe Freya of Blowsabella fame and Sarah Matthews, who's local um, fiddle player played in Coppola and various bands, various lineups. Absolutely stunning gig. Loads of local friends and some students came along and even my parents turned up. They live two hours away, so it's not local for them, but that was lovely to see them. Um, and then Tuesday, uh, what was I doing on Tuesday? I think it was just a day at home teaching, but it was a busy one. Same thing on Wednesday. Um, Thursday, we had a Morai day with our new project framed the Alice Wielden story. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, and then in the evening we had another gig over near Peterborough. Absolutely brilliant. Again, fabulous audience, very, very funny, singing along with everything, joining in with all the harmonies and heckling us, which was, you know, just very welcome and fantastic. Um, and then Friday, a new project kicked off with, um, the Composite Orchestra, which is a, a group, Composite have been around for a number of years, but um, they are, uh, Joe Freyer is the artistic director of this project called Young Composers. And basically we have five young people between the ages of 15 and 21, all with their own ideas of what they want to create, it's a piece of music, um, which will be developed over three workshops and then recorded and performed um, sort of mid to the end of April. And we had the first workshops um, on Friday and Saturday with four of our young composers. And tomorrow we've got the fifth that we're meeting in the morning. All phenomenally talented and lots and lots of new things for me to wrap my brain around, working in crazy modes and using lots of scales. So Jenna, you'll be probably very interested to hear about um, how this project progresses. Um, and I'm working with some fascinating people. Me, um, Joe and Sarah are all involved with that. And Joe May, percussionist Joe May, um, a chap called Colin Reed, who is a phenomenal classically trained singer and violinist and pianist. Um, he's the one with the knowledge, you know, if we need to know anything about um, theory, he's the one we go to. And then there's an awesome rock bassist and guitarist called Mary, who tends to tour with the Meatloaf story and various other kind of rock shows and stuff. So she's pretty wicked. Um, so together, we're kind of all working with these young people to bring their creations to life and collaborate with them and sort of create some new pieces. Um, so yeah, that was Friday and Saturday. Sunday, we got up early and which was yesterday, we traveled to Devon, South Devon, me, Joe and Sarah, and we did a gig at Folk on the Moor, which is in Lee Mill, Ivy Bridge. It's not really the middle of nowhere, but it's hard to kind of pin it down. It's between Devon, uh, sorry, it's between Plymouth and Dartmouth. Um, and again, a third fantastic gig, brilliant audience, loads of people came. I know a lot of Wreckers Morris from down near Cornwall, the Tamar Valley. Even my sister drove two hours up from Falmouth to come and see me. Um, so yeah, all in all, it's been a fabulous week, but very tiring. And um, it's not looking to stop. There's more happening this week. I'm teaching at Halsey on Friday. It's my birthday on Thursday. Um, and yeah, loads more stuff, more composite stuff next weekend as well. So that's kind of why my shelves are empty. My instruments are being very heavily used at the moment and uh, all brilliant. And I've spent four minutes wittering on about myself. We have got a list of questions to kick us off this evening. If you've got any questions that are under you know sort of burning to be um sort of got out there if you're wanting an answer to your question about melodium playing um performance anything that i can help you with um i will do my very best so just let me know in the comments and i will get round to it so i'm going to kick off tonight i had an email from a guy in upstate new york in america called yusuf and he is um 
somebody who's had a box in the attic for a long time. He had a BC Honer accordion, um, sort of diatonic accordion, and he decided to get it tuned and sort of wanted to start playing. Um, but he realised that the instrument wasn't um, suited to the music that he wanted to play. I mean, he's got quite a broad interest in traditional music of British Isles, um, Breton, Scandinavia, Quebecis, um, and or Quebecois. And we're never quite sure how to say that. Um, so yeah, he wants to sort of play lots and lots of different types of music. And for those different types of music, there are different key signatures that are kind of standard and you know more acceptable. Um, please let me know if that's becoming an issue if you can hear me it's vibrating through the walls <laughs> um or also let me know if it's fine and just shut up and carry on talking because uh, i i don't know how you're receiving me um so he decided to get rid of the bc diatonic accordion and buy himself a chromatic button accordion which for those of you that don't know is not limited on it's got all of the black and white notes and it plays the same note in the same di in, in different directions so it's essentially like a piano accordion but instead of piano keys it has buttons um so but he's not coping well with the weight it's an eight kilogram instrument and it's quite large but he can play in all of the keys so therefore he can play all of the music that he's interested in but is struggling with lugging this instrument around um he says that he's an, a, an older gentleman who uh yeah just needs something a bit smaller so he's found an instrument um from bernard Loffe who sadly is no longer with us but his family are continuing his legacy and still building instruments um in Brittany. And I never heard of this instrument before, but um, Bernard Loffe are making a small, lightweight chromatic accordion. And I've just read up, I'm, I, I'm assuming it's Bernard's language, um, and basically it, it essentially building an instrument that plays in lots of different keys, is lightweight, but still sounds like a diatonic instrument. Um, so the quality of the reeds is very good, very high. It's got 10 bases, uh, sorry, it's got 20 bases on the left hand, 10 of which are bases, and 10 of which are open chords or thirdless chords, if you want to call it that. So, and it seems there are various layouts that you can get. I personally, I don't read solfa. So sol, fa, de, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, la. I don't read that. I don't know what that is, but there are lists of um, a few different layouts. So obviously, and I'm, I'm sure they would custom lay out um, something that, you know, you would you would want yourself. So you can choose what you would want on the left hand. So basically, his question is, um, he's in a bit of a quandary. He doesn't know whether just to get multiple diatonic boxes or just get one lightweight chromatic accordion. Um, and it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, my opinion has always been, you know, buy an instrument and find as many ways of making it work um, for the different kind of music that, that you want to play. But at the same time, with that span of instrument, you know, a span of music that you're interested in, if there are particular keys that are popular, you kind of want them to be easy for you to play in, right? And you want the left hand accompaniment to be easy. You don't want to be kind of hashing it up or missing too many notes out. So you'd start to think, well, maybe I want a 12 bass instrument or maybe, you know, something a bit bigger, maybe even an 18 bass. But then as soon as you go bigger, you add more weight. This has kind of been the predicament I've been in for the last few months and, you know, previous times I've talked about my thinking process there. Um, so the more buttons you give yourself, the more chromaticism, which is not a word, but you make yourself more chromatic even though you're still a diatonic instrument it's still a push pull essentially you're still kind of limited on the main rows of the instrument but if say if you went for a three row 18 bass you'd have that extra third row that you could configure to be accidentals and reversals in different octaves and therefore you're giving yourself that kind of chromatic feel you're able to play in more keys and with the 18 basses you'd have a series of reversals there too so just because um, you wouldn't have so many limitations on the left hand, but extra weight could be an issue. So maybe sticking to just two row eight bases and getting multiple two row eight base boxes in various kind of conditions, depending on your budget. I personally was very inspired seeing Frederick Paris um, playing with Vont de Galan um, at the Grand Bal de Bath. I'm not sure it runs anymore, but I was there in 2012, I think. 
and to see him on stage he he's got three or maybe four 208 bass boxes and all of them tune differently so he's got a gc a cf a dg and something else maybe an nad or something like that but um you know, he just plays that and what he gets out of that instrument because he puts in a lot of second melodies and uh, second voices and lots of right hand harmony. It sounds so rich and full. We'd think, well, why would I ever need to upgrade? You know, he sounds fantastic. So it's a tricky one. I don't kind of want to tell you what to do. And I appreciate that you've kind of emailed me for my opinion. I really like the look of this Bernard Lofe box. I don't know what they sound like or feel like. This is the thing. I've never seen one. I don't know anybody that owns one. I don't know how popular they are. Um, and the fact that you're in America, as you say, you don't have the luxury of kind of seeing a lot of instruments or being able to go and try stuff out before you buy it. So it's a bit of a gamble. I like the look of it. I th it reads really well. Like ha His thinking behind it, the reasoning for him des designing the instrument seems to be very on point with what you want from that kind of music and that kind of instrument so I'm sort of tempted if you've got the the capital to fund it I'm kind of tempted to say go for it you know go for it and see it's it's half the weight of what you've got currently um and if that's the only thing holding you back you know you know you've got all of your keys you've got lots of lovely bases in all directions it's just the weight and it's smaller, I think I think it might be worth a gamble. And actually, I'm really interested. I'd love to see one myself because, um, you know, there are lots of people in this country that want to play um, lots of different keys but not have lots and lots of different instruments because of, you know, financial reasons. So I think it's a, it's a good shout to go for something with more buttons um, and then look for something that fits your weight category, if you like. So, Yusuf, I hope you find this. I will email you and you'll be able to see me yatter, uh, nattering on about your predicament. But keep me updated and let me know. And if anybody else is having any kind of issues with, I want to play this music, but I don't know what instrument to have, pop in the questions, uh, pop in the comments even, and let me know, pop a question across to me and um, let me see if I can help you in your predicament. Um, fab. <laughs> thanks Polly he has stopped now um so it's gone nice and quiet here and it was fine anyway so that's all good to hear and I'm looking forward to seeing you on Thursday it's going to be very very fun um okay so maybe I've talked for a long time Tammy's asked me to play something will you play one of the the tunes you use for your new Border Morris team you've given me a great like lead in there to talk about Wilkes's gob thanks very much um, would love to feel the sort of border it is, if that makes any sense. Totally makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I am, and me and a bunch of friends, it's not just me, are starting a local Border Morris side. I live in South Derbyshire in the UK, and around my very local area, there is a plethora of local industrial heritage and history. So what I mean by that is, you know, in Victorian industrial era um monuments in, in terms of buildings and canals and bridges and factories and industries that are still going um, and it includes brewing I'm about 10 minutes away from Burton on Trent which I believe if I remember rightly from my national brewery tour was the place that invented beer so kind of internationally brilliant right <laughs> I mean it's quite significant um, so yeah if you like beer come and check out the National Brewery Centre it's absolutely phenomenal and you get a free pint at the end of it so um, We've got lots of canals and we have pipe works. I mean, my very, I live in a place that was famous for um, sanitary wear and sewage pipes, which isn't the most like sensational thing to talk about. But apparently the clay in the local area is the best for salt glazed sanitary wear and um, sewage pipes. So there we go. Um, and we've got brickworks locally, collieries um, and... Yeah, there's there's a lot going on. So me and a bunch of mates have got together and we've started um, for the last year and a half. We've been writing dances to demonstrate the local, sometimes the local decline or celebration or stories, myths, characters, legends, that kind of thing. So we're writing dances and I've um, given a lot of my own music to these dances, as well as some trad stuff as well. So I'll play you 
one of my tunes. I played this in a session for the first time. Um, I don't tend to play my own stuff in sessions. I think it's a little bit egotistical. It's not something I feel very comfortable with. But if people ask me to do it, then, or if I've had enough beer and I feel comfortable enough with the group of people I'm with, then I'll just kind of play it. And then at the end, if they're sort of like, oh, that was all right. Yeah, what was that? I'll tell them it was mine. But I'm not the sort of person just to plow in and play my own stuff. Um, but yeah, it went down really nicely. This is a tune called Trespasser, and it's um, Trespasser came about because we were looking into the River Trent runs locally to me, and it's a big river, and it's also got a very, very wide floodplain, and it bre breaches its banks very regularly um, in lots of bad weather. So the, the actual word tre uh, Trent means to trespass or means trespass. So we have written a dance all to do with eddies and currents and flow and flooding and ebbing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this is the tune that goes with it. So I'll put it down in case you ever want to know or see. This is my DG Castagnari Trilli. Um, and let's see if I can play it. It's been a, been a little while. Um, so, yeah. It's an E minor, classic Border Morris key. <laughs> dramatic ending to it which I like and somebody has said already Dan Dan Fawcett when you watch this back somebody's already said it's a bit like a pig dyke tune and I guess when I wrote it I, I was still tentatively part of Ooze Washers Molly which is no longer for me um, all good things just you know things move on and they're a long way away from me um, and I loved that music I loved playing alongside Nikki Stockman and Steve Dumpleton and Jan Alton and that groove really kind of bed into my bones. And this particular dance um, kind of it's done without sticks. So it's it's Molly ish. And the reason we've done that is um, we found that locally in Burton on Trent, the um, the workers that worked in the malt houses to kind of rake the grains over the hot floor that was kind of letting them steam and germinate ready to go into the beer production process. Um, a lot of people, young lads working in that malt house, were actually from Norfolk, um, and they were known as the Norkies. And I thought, well, that's great to have a connection with Norfolk and the Fens, um, where Molly dancing originated from. Brilliant. We can legitimately do some Molly style stuff, um, which made me very, very happy. Um, and in, just to kind of aside from that, the phrase gone for a Burton, if you've ever heard that, it means he's disappeared off the face of the earth. We don't know where he is. He's gone for a Burton um, actually means it kind of originates from people from Norfolk going to Burton to work in the malt houses and then finding pretty wives to bed down with and then never going home. So they'd never see their family again, essentially. So they'd always say, oh, he's gone for a Burton, <laughs> um, which is um, another dance that we've written as well actually 
So, yeah, there's loads of awesome things like that that just give us the best names. Um, I mean, I am out of my mind with locally, just literally I could walk to it. There's a place called Albert Village where there's a beautiful lake where there used to be a clay pit. And the village of Albert, uh, the village of Albert Village used to be known by the locals that worked there called Borough Knock. And it was because they were very much kind of all within each other's houses. You know, the, the people that worked there used to look after each other and they'd always be going around knocking on their doors and asking to borrow sugar or butter or milk or whatever it would be that they needed. So it would be borrow knock. Um, I'm just going around to knock on the door to borrow something. And uh, I just love that. And borrow knock, you know, it just has this kind of stick clashing feel to it. So that's that's an idea that I want to put to, to the group. and. Uh, we'll write something called borrow knock so yeah very very excited about that we've got a recruitment day on sunday the 31st of march in church gresley where i live and if you're interested we've got people traveling in for it we are an infrequently meeting team we don't practice weekly we practice for a full day um on a weekend day usually every sort of four to six weeks um so it's great for morris tarts and people that have busy lives and our initial plan is to be more of a winter side. But if we get the numbers and people can commit, I definitely have a drive to do festivals and stuff in the summer. So but it's just the numbers we've got currently and the kind of um, commitment we've got currently is more of a winter based side. But honest to God, if we get the numbers on 31st of March, then that it, that will really make it happen because we're at a point where we can't continue. We've got um, six people entirely including musicians <laughs> so that um that needs to change in order for us to go forward and i think we've got a lot of great ideas and passion for good performance which is what we're all about so if that kind of appeals to you if the music that you've heard if the stories you've heard appeal to you um then get in touch wilkes is gob um which I won't explain now because I've talked about this for quite a while and there's loads of questions. Um, but yeah, come and find us on Facebook and give me an email. And um, so let's uh, kind of meet up and get this thing going anyway. <laughs> um, cool. Um, right then. So another question while people are listening and commenting away. So on Melnet, we've had a comment, as we always do, left by Jenna Chrisman. Thank you very much, Jenna. I love your questions every month. Um, they're always really interesting and well thought out. And that's brilliant. I love that. Um, so there's a couple of questions here. And I've kind of, um, I've got them up on screen, but I've done a sort of quick note taking from them as well. So the first one that she's asked is about arranging as a box player in a band or kind of session um, sort of environment. And what she says is, I think that you often take turns weaving what each member plays between melody and accompaniment, but we can just do both at the same time because we have right and left hand, so we can play a melody and accompany it. And the counter melody at the same time, too, because we have, you know, we can split our hand and play two different things on the right hand. Um, so do you have any strategies you can share that you have found that work well in your ensembles? Um, so what I'd first what I'd firstly say is that I'm not I'm not the most experienced person when it comes to playing in ensembles. Um, the way that I've kind of developed my style, if you like. To, the, to this day, it's still in development, is really through the work that I've done with Morai, um, which is again, me, Joe Freyer and Sarah Matthews. And really through growing my confidence in that scenario and following my nose. I mean, when, when Joe first approached me and said, do you want to start a band with me? I was like, I wasn't a professional musician. It was like, it was where I was headed, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do at that point in time. So I can remember the first kind of, few rehearsals and I felt a little bit out of my depth but it kind of creatively really turned me on and I tried to put that fear into what I was trying to achieve and it really made me think outside of what I was already doing on my instrument which was predominantly English dance music in sessions and for Morris so I started I mean because I was accompanying singers I had to start looking at playing in different keys. And at that point in time, I only had a DG instrument. I didn't have any other keys. And singing in D and G is not great for female vocalists. So um, 
we started to kind of look at playing in C quite a bit and occasionally in A minor, which it's still a bit of a strain, but we kind of had to make it work just because of the instrumentation that we had. Um, and sometimes we sing in D, actually. So we've still got stuff in the set list that is in G. So, you know, say all of that aside, we still sing in those keys, but ideally they're not like fantastic for everybody. I think between the three of us, we've got quite a broad range vocally, so we can kind of deal with it. But yeah, playing in C and B minor, we do that for like four things, maybe C a little bit more. B minor, we play a few things in B minor. And there's some tunes that I've written. Brexit Biscuits is one of mine that's in B minor-ish. Um, and yeah, so going outside of my usual zone. And it didn't feel uncomfortable because to me, you've got a set of notes, you've got these buttons, and you've just got to work out how they fit to work with the melody that you want to play. And if you find that there are notes that you don't have, then you find alternatives or you, you leave a gap, essentially. That was kind of my thinking behind it. On the left hand, I do as much as I can. So sometimes I'll drop to just using basses. I pretty much always play with thirds out. So I always have open chords because then that opens you up to modes and um, it also leaves some space. So I found, I can't remember where I got this in my head, but maybe it was from a workshop that I did or talking to, to a strings player. It wasn't actually talking to Sarah, but if you if you play full chords with the third in, it ties the tuning down quite abruptly and for a strings player a strings player you know a fiddle player will actually be creating they're crafting the note because they are they're not a fretted instrument they're not a button instrument so they they have to actually place their finger precisely to get that tuning correct and each player will do that to a degree of subtlety that will change the intonation super subtly between those those notes so the tuning between the box and the fiddle can sometimes be, you know, it, it's, it's a movable feat, basic, basically. Um, so I, if I don't play a third, then I kind of leave that tuning up to Sarah. I said, that's how I think about it. I'm kind of handing it over to her. I'm not leaving, I'm, I'm broadening the range within which she can place her finger to create a major or a minor sound. If I'm playing an open, if I'm playing a first and a fifth, that channel of the third down the middle is open for her to use or not if she wants to leave it open. So that was one of the biggest things for me is, is using chords um, in different keys and thinking about who you're playing with and how they create the sound that they do. Um, a kind of a tuning thing as well, when I was playing with Box Tet and we had famously rehearsed for like two years and did one gig and then we disbanded. But um, we were four box players, me, Ollie King, Matt Quinn and Owen Woods. And we found out that you could only really deal with two wet instruments and two dry instruments, any kind of other combination. And it was just too much tremolo or too much dryness. Um, so tuning was quite kind of imperative for us to, to get right and to think about in that lineup as well. But um, yeah, so when you're accompanying when I accompany, I don't feel I can kind of teach this necessarily, but I can tell you what I do. Um, I'm quite, I feel I'm quite basic. I think um, when I look, when I listen back and when, last night when I was playing some of the stuff from my first album, I feel like I'm doing really basic things that are quite boring, actually. Like to, for, for a player just to keep repeating the same kind of rhythm along the same chord sequence for a whole song it's it's not interesting as a player but you're playing you're a role within that ensemble you are the accompanist you're the guitarist if you like what's actually interesting what people are listening to is the song and the lyrics um so that always sort of brings me back into that you don't want to detract from what's going on and I apply the same when I'm playing for dance you don't want to do anything that's going to take the um, interest away from the dancers because you are there for the dancers and when you're accompanying a singer you are there to accompany the singer or if you're accompanying somebody that's playing the melody you can obviously if you want to have some interplay between that then you can but it, it's very it's that kind of what do you, how do you want to kind of put it forward but yeah I think accompany, accompanists that can sink into the background and not be noticed but if they weren't playing 
would leave a gap that's kind of the perfect medium that's kind of where I feel comfortable basically and as I've you know the, the second album we did here and now um there there's loads more on there that I do and I feel I contributed a lot more because I believed in myself a lot more my confidence was a lot better I I'd already I decided to go freelance by this point we recorded the first album in 2014 which was my first year as a freelance musician and then in 2017 we recorded the second album so I had three years under my belt of doing all sorts of brilliant projects and growing and learning in my personal life and that all fed into how I felt about being in my ensembles and now we're going to be recording our third album this year. We're writing it, the Alice Wielden project, which I think I alluded to last month. We've now launched it. It's called Framed, the Alice Wielden story. And um, if you pop over to the More I page, I'll put a link. Um, I'll write down to send a link to it because I want you people to know about this. It's absolutely fascinating. Alice Wielden is a Derby suffragist or was a Derby suffragist, an anti-war campaigner, a socialist a mother who was protecting her son who was on the run from the conscription to go to the First World War. And as a group of pacifists, as a family of pacifists, they believed, they, they didn't believe in the war. Um, so there's that story. But then the MI5, as, as they, they were kind of, the MI5 didn't really exist, but it existed in various different sort of facets of the um, military offices of the government. Um, they sent out spies into Derby to try and find war saboteurs that were basically working in Rolls Royce, um, putting kind of sawdust in the fuses and stuff like that. They they'd got wind that there were people in Derby that were anti-war, and they found Alice. Um, they were just sniffing around for leads. They found Alice and they talked her into getting some poison, and they, and uh, basically. They strung her up. They they got her and they embellished the story beyond belief. And um, she was found guilty for plotting to murder the prime minister, her and two of her daughters and her daughter's husband. So it's it, it it's a story of multifacets, and we're absolutely enthralled by it. And there are high points. There's comedy, and there's also like tragic low points in there as well, and some very very deep sadness. And we are blogging our story as we go, page to stage. You can find find more details up. We put our first video up last week, and it's on also on our YouTube channel. And um, we'll be doing that throughout the year. We're launching the album in October, and we're re obviously writing, recording it, and launching it this year. And I going back to what I was saying about the um, confidence and where it's kind of led me as an accompanist I'm now I've written some songs that's never happened I've got confidence to do that I've always thought that I might do it but I've written some songs and my melody writing feels a lot more accomplished and my ideas for accompaniment are a lot more accomplished we're yet to actually have some play days with this new material we're writing and kind of sharing stuff between us but actually arranging it we've not got to that stage yet but I'm really feeling very um relaxed and confident about my contribution to this band the other thing as well is in the six years that we've been going now I feel like I, we've all got roles you know we've kind of settled into roles and that's not in a negative or you know they've become boring and they're kind of stuck in their way it's just you know where we kind of fit and obviously from those viewpoints then we can kind of offer things and my viewpoint from the very beginning actually was the kind of basket I can hold the whole sound together because I've got the bass end, the bass guitar, essentially, or the cello um, and the sort of the more trebly sounds of the fiddle and the clarinets and everything. So I kind of try to hold everything together. I do do a lot of stuff chordally um, and sort of broken arpeggiated chords that's definitely something I quite like to do I started I mean I love always love minimalism and cinematic scores Hans Zimmer and Jan Tiersen a big kind of um I, I love what they do so I I've always been interested in that repetitive pattern making and how you can kind of create I mean there's something I do in Brexit biscuits and I do it in other things as well but this is the one I'll demonstrate where I come out of a chord sequence. Um, actually, it, it's the second tune of that. It's Calorem Calorem Pa. And there's this. This is the A music. And then it goes into the B music where I drop to a kind of 
I don't know what I call it, but I'll I'll show you. in unison come back to the melody and it adds this super tension underneath what's going on on top um and yeah so i'm essentially i'm, I'm holding a note a high b and i've got those in both directions so then what i've got is this kind of this pedal note or i don't know what you'd call it but this moving note that is lower than that basically of sort of different ways that you know it's not just right hand chords but there's like little riffs and stuff that you can find that will kind of build the tension or give you that romantic kind of flair or that little bit of joy that happiness that up that uplift or you know downlift um so yeah and a bit of wittering around accompaniment but as i say it's not something i i don't i don't teach it but it's something that i've been developing i guess but it's i don't feel I don't feel like I'm fully formed, but there's some ideas, hopefully, that will make sense there. Um, yeah, not not over overcoming other instruments, I suppose, is, is one of the best things. And particularly as a melodeon player, you know, you can do a lot, but also sometimes just doing something super simple, like a drone and one note is like one of the most beautiful things that you can do and maybe one of the most um, intense and appropriate things is just to kind of have this really, really subtle drone. Um, so taking a lot of sound away, dropping to single reeds, taking out your thirds, not playing the left hand at all, just having a drone on the right hand can be like a really subtle thing. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to leave that one there. I could probably spill a whole hour of talking about how I have kind of created and got into that headspace of generating landscape and emotion through music with the melodeon but if you want to hear more about that then let me know maybe i can do like a themed thing next month and talk a bit more about that but um we i'm going to have a look through the comments and see what people are talking about but we've got some more questions people have been really great with the questions this month which is all what it's all about um so i can see going back up we've got sue wales hello um looking at some play for tunes i'm familiar with the tunes the time signature is six four how would I, how would you suggest I tackle the left hand? So you could, a 6-4, you can think of it like a 3-2 hornpipe. So if you take that mathematically, divide those two numbers by half, divide them by two. So you'd end up with a 3-2. Um, and you can kind of create the same sort of feel to it. Um, Six four is kind of the same. It's just it's just represented rather than as minims. It's represented as crotchets, and there are six of them in the bar as opposed to three of them in the bar. Um, and actually, for me, with three two horn pipes, I actually think of them as six fours. <laughs> so I'm going around in circles a little bit. But if you take a three two horn pipe you've got three beats in the bar that doesn't the, within those three beats it doesn't give you a lot of detail on the left hand so if you double everything up and make them shorter notes but more of them all of a sudden you've got more hooks to hang things on i do it also with tunes in four four 
if you think about them in eight as eight 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 quavers rather than four crotchets you've instantly got more little bits more micro beats more little bits of detail so a three two hornpipe standard rusty gully this is like my go-to three two um instead of thinking about it as three minims think about it as six crotchets and then we accompany number one um, we accompany number one number four and number six so that means that two three and five don't get anything so you have to kind of train yourself to leave gaps one two three four five one two three four five. Mm, it's hard to count it and say it and play it so that's one bar of the tune. accompanying it there are a couple of others but that's like my my basic intro so hopefully that will help you there Sue. um uh polly asks is your day seeking just dancers or musicians as well um so the wilkes is god recruitment day we are desperate for dancers but we will not turn musicians away we've got a lot of interest in musicians which is fantastic very very little interest is dancers if you are a musician and a dancer we'll have you that's brilliant fantastic that's kind of what i want to be um i want to go back to my dancing days and do some more dancing but i think at the moment i'm very much needed in the band um which is not a problem but we want to kind of develop our dancing so yeah you'd be more than welcome to come up and join us for that day and see what you think um Oh yeah, Denise asks for the dots. You should see my diary, Denise. And I'm I'm sorry, I did say I'd send them out, um, but I'm finding that with everything that's going on at the moment, any downtime I get, any 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 time I get where I'm not needed anywhere, I'm just on the sofa and completely flaked out. But I appreciate that, you know, you want to have a look at stuff before that day. Um, so bear with me. Sometime this week, I've got some time tomorrow afternoon. It was my intention to do it this afternoon, but I just flaked after my journey back from Devon. Um, so please bear with me. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, CW says, wow, so much on Alice Wheeldon. I had never heard of her until now. We haven't either until we did a, a Google search. We were looking for local we were looking for something with a feminist theme. That was my kind of want for our next album. And we kind of went down the route of women in work, the history of women in work. And that was such a broad topic and fascinating women involved in, you know, all of those kind of areas of pre-World War One, World War One, you know, factories and that kind of stuff. And and where we are today and that would be a, a brilliant project. But it was a bit broad and Joe was very keen that we we narrowed it down. And Sarah happened to mention that she'd got a song about a local Derby suffragist and the name Alice Wielden. And when we Googled her, we found the Wikipedia page first and um, have since sort of found the her living descendants and relatives. And they are campaigning for her um, appeal in the uh, uh, campaigning for justice to be corrected or whatever the word is where you get your name removed from um, the law books, essentially, because um, there's there's a lot of evidence to suggest that she was set up and that things at the trial weren't handled well, um, including a key witness that wasn't put on the stand. So it's still an open case. We can't quite say, you know, for certain that she's innocent. And there are, you know, certain things that she wasn't innocent, you know, for, but, you know, it, it leaves a lot to be um, questioned, which, you know, will make a, a fantastic show. And that's why we're doing it. That's why we want people to know about it, because it's going to be um, a great show. And, and we're going to write, we're writing a whole album. It will be a full show and it, we're going to take it on tour and all that kind of stuff. So 
if you want it if, please book us you know let me know we're, we're kind of we're, we're looking at live and local and stuff like that but um yeah if you want this show coming ne near to you and you want some people that will come and play for you and leave you with this fabulous good feeling um about music and life in general then uh, that's generally the feedback that we're getting at the moment so please let us know um uh, uh, colin elliott general question do boxes need much maintenance? Mine has seemed a bit more of an air hog in places. Is this bad luck, me being too heavy handed or do they need a bit of TLC from time to time? Um, yes. So generally it depends on the quality of the instrument. So I know that you play a Sherwood Shire. Do correct me if I'm wrong, but I've played a couple of them and they're, they're not bad boxes. You know, they're kind of on the cheaper end of the market, but they're nice wooden solid build instruments. Um, I haven't played one long enough to tell if, you know, it's going to break on me or anything like that, but I could tell that it was well put together. Um, generally with brand new instruments, they've not been played in, so they will tend to go out of tune quicker, um, usually within about a year. It depends how much you play it. This one will need a bit of a tune. This was brand new last February, and I've played it quite heavily over the year, and I can tell it's still in tune to most people's ears but to my kind of quite sensitive musical ears it's kind of a bit it needs some tweaking which is natural and then it probably won't need it for the next five or six um because it's the top of the range instrument and the reeds are eager quality so they don't need a lot of you know fettling and that kind of stuff in terms of air leakage um that will be to do with either the gaskets which is where the bellows connect to the wooden ends of the instrument there's usually a kind of little layer of neoprene on older instruments it will be probably just a bit of rope um, or some kind of um, waxed um, twine that kind of goes around so that will fail over time and I know that Mike Robottom and Martin White now you and Theo Gibb I think as well uses like neoprene so if you get a new gasket it will be a good squishy uh, sort of material that doesn't need replacement very often and keeps a really good tight air seal um, you might want to check just kind of with your face next to the bellows and just putting some air through it with the air button and you can kind of sense or with your hand kind of out around you can kind of sense if there's going to be any air leakage you can feel it on on your face or on your hand I use my face because it's really really sensitive you know you've got all these all <laughs> whiskers if you're lucky but um you know you can kind of sense it more uh, sensitively on your face so you can kind of go around to the instrument and see if you've got any leaks in your bellows. If you have, um, what's really, really great is some insulating tape. I've got various different colours, but this is just like electrical insulating tape. And what's great about it is that it's slightly stretchy. Um, so it, it seals really, really well. So you can see that there's it kind of stretches and it's, it's very, very sticky. So if you find anything, you can just kind of get a bit of this and stick it down your bellows like that. Gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this to a castagnari, but there we go. So you can kind of get a nice seal depending on where you where you find your leak at all. And that can go all over. I mean, I've seen bellows usually on old holers that have got, you know, got it right down in all the creases and the crevices and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And in terms of heavy handedness. I've you know you're a student of mine I don't think you play particularly heavy-handedly saying that I've not seen you play for Morris and I know that I'm very you know powering away for Morris um and it might be you know if you're not using the air button as much when you're really going for it then there'll be a lot of excess pressure that might be finding its way out through the gaskets or you know through the bellows seams or something like that um so we can look at technique with the air button in um you know in our lessons um but yeah i think that's about it for now um on that kind of stuff in terms of just general tlc and maintenance um tuning is the most kind of obvious thing i suppose but you know you might want to sort of just take a little brush or a hoover open them up every now and again they do sometimes collect dust particularly if you're morris and you're playing outside they'll get a bit of grit you know it still gets through the grill fabric and stuff like that so just kind of get a get a hoover with a, a, paint, a clean paintbrush and you can just go in there and kind of sweep it out with the hoover essentially um not on top of the reeds but kind of within the sound um chamber and stuff like that uh yeah that's that's about it really they're quite kind of easy maintenance 
instruments in that case. Um, cool. So we've got some more questions. Um, Jenna's second question was about suggesting different stuff to a group of Melodian players that she plays with. I suppose I was interpreting that as a session. So I will go over to Melnick because she's put it a lot more eloquently than I just did. Um, so, yeah. So she says that basically occasionally she suggests things to a group of Melodian players that she um, plays with locally to her. Um, like, how about we play something in C or have you tried B Phrygian? Now, I have to say, when I read that, I did have a little bit of a chuckle because me and Jenna have been talking about modes. She's been asking me about modes and I'm kind of getting into it. And particularly with this composite project that I talked about in the beginning um, that I've just started a lot of the young composers are working in modes and it's like it's blowing my mind but I've known about I've known about modes for years I've known how they work and what they are and how to work them out since about September last year <laughs> and I've got myself a crib sheet and I'm sort of like I'm a bit slow I'm having to work it out it's not like instant knowledge um so I had to look up I had to google B Phrygian and work it out and it's possible on the Melodian yeah basically it's a scale of G major but starting on a B yeah I think that's correct so yeah but obviously you say it as B Phrygian and you can instantly kind of put people off and that's kind of what she's saying is that she wants to um sort of suggest doing some different stuff to this group of Melodian players but not put them off in the meantime and um she sort of relates it to dark sorcery and stuff like that um I mean, for me personally, I've I suppose I've been quite lucky in the group of people I've grown up with around folk music since the age of 10, 11. Um, there's some names like Rosie Butler Hall and probably lots of names that you wouldn't know as well. Danny Pedler was definitely in the, in that group. My Morris mates, a lot of the Harlequin people. I've known them for so long and we've kind of grown up together and the adults and the parents and stuff that we grew up with. We we yes we played we rattled through Morris repertoire and we we rattled through all sorts but nothing was ever taboo, um, and usually as the night would dwindle down and the people that were left in the barn you know at two a.m. were still going we'd kind of get into that weird zone I used to call it the fizzle down, um, meaning that it kind of like a nice juicy condensed sauce that you'd left on the stove for about an hour and a half and it's got really thick and it's got really unctuous and delicious and tasty that was like the 2am group that were left in the bar. It was like, now's the time to suggest all this weird stuff. Or I've just learnt this tune, can I play it to you? You know, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a session tune. But, you know, if you're in a group of people that are open-minded or maybe aren't necessarily accomplished but are happy to sit and listen to you try something out, and then if they're willing, then they can join in as well, then it's often the nicest way to feel accepted and adventurous within your music um and then usually at the end you know you'd either get a recording throughout or you'd stop and you'd have a chat about where you could where did you get that tune or you know shall we try it again should we try it as a mazurka rather than a you know rather than a reel or um you know should we try it in f major rather than you know g or something like that and you know those kind of conversations tend to happen at the later hours in my experience or with they can happen at you know normal times of day as well if it's the right crowd if it's the right group of people um and what i mean by that is it's just people that are open-minded and will listen and take on board and be prepared to have a go at the same time or suggest things of their own um i started a session a steady speed session when i lived in kidderminster still going um obviously with different people running it now but um I'd run it as a steady speed session for the first hour and then after that it was basically a free-for-all but you know maintaining a air of respect for anybody that still wanted to play slowly and that would have a, its own fizzle down at about 11 o'clock at night because it was a Monday so it was still a school night and there were some really great um, advanced musicians that would come all night and I loved them because they were really supportive of the beginners and everything um, but then at that about 11 p.m. we'd have our own fizzle down and everybody kind of jumped in with different ideas and there was some great Norwegian music and you know if somebody had just been to a workshop with a random musician and brought back what they'd learned and there was always a really nice atmosphere of sharing and that is the biggest thing I think that has been 
not lost, but it's rare to find it now in a session is that, you know, that chance to share something that you found and have a bit of a chat about it, you know, work it out with people. Um, so I think don't be afraid to try these things and, you know, use language that is encouraging. So, you know, if you're going to say be Phrygian, explain what it is, maybe just play through the scale with everybody, show them, take that moment just to go, well, I'll show you what it is. Let me play it to you. And now let me play you a really simple tune in that mode. Um, you know, I always use bear dance or something like that, you know, or a tune that you can kind of really simply put into a different key or a different mode or something like that. Um, so, yeah, never be afraid to suggest things, but you want to put it across in a way that people are going to, um, you know, accept it. And yeah. Oh, look, Willow. Oh, she, she's gone. But um, yeah little willow just came to say hi she, she's she's going i got the cats some new uh some new litter beds today because i realized that one between two was causing issues with territory so aldi 899 there we go um <laughs> so yeah that's hopefully answered that question jenna if i haven't then just let me know on melnet i'm happy to whitter away a little bit longer about that on there um there's no other questions come through on the comments on um, YouTube. So I'm going to plow on onto the, the questions that came in from Melnet and comments on Facebook and different things. Um, so Malcolm Bebb on Melnet says variations for dancers or, or so he was, I'm, I'm reading my notes. It doesn't mean anything. He was asking whether variations in the music when playing for Morris, is it, should it be kind of thought of to be for the dancers or the musicians or the audience or a combination of all three? And um, I think what he means is variations, either choosing a different variant of a tune or just like little ornaments or kind of a bit of flair, a bit of flourish, a bit of your own style coming in. Who's it for? Well, I noticed that um, Steve Freereader, as he is on Melnet, Steve Dumpleton to um, everyone else who doesn't know him as Steve Freereader, has given a really beautiful answer that I, I agree with in a lot of ways. And it's basically you, you never kind of want to feel like you're playing something the same all the time because that's boring. That is boring for us as musicians and probably as dancers as well. The audience probably wouldn't get it because unless they're going to follow you around and watch you over and over and over again, they're not going to be able to pick up on that stuff. Um, but he used the phrase um, playing should be a form of living art when you're playing for dance it should be like living art and I really like that and I think playing with Stephen who's washes Molly it was always like that there was always kind of somebody putting a harmony in or somebody putting a bass run in and it was never to detract from what the dancers were doing it was only ever done at a certain time during the dance that would emphasize what the dancers were doing and that was part of the fun of it um I think playing for Cotswold so me playing for Harlequin I I do put quite a bit into it and I, I used to be quite I used to think of myself as quite a cut back musician and I probably said it in one of these a few months ago but I was thinking about it last weekend when I was playing for Harlequin and actually there's quite a lot that I do but it's not to be flamboyant in a show-offy way it's just as a kind of empowering um, driving force for the dancers so I tend to hold a couple of notes down to emphasize um, emphasize a kind of push off. So if you've got dancers going from a standing figure to a moving figure or chorus or whatever, then I use kind of a bit more oomph. I put a different sound into the tune by holding another note down just to give it a bit of a <laughs> um, And yeah, I, I think variations should only ever be for a purpose and it should only be for the purpose of between you the musician and the dancers um it can also be used to add interest for the musician but only ever if it's gonna not deter uh, detract from what the dancers are doing i think that's the kind of succinct way of putting it um in terms of doing it for the audience that doesn't matter because what the audience are watching is what's going on between you, the dance, uh, you, the musician and the dancers. And essentially they're only really watching the dancers and the, and the, mo the movement and everything that's going on there. Um, the music kind of 
fade fade into the background. You know, we, we have a purpose. We have a point of being there. Um, but I think going back to the accompanist thing, the best form of accompaniment is to kind of be in the background, like a really great drummer. You don't notice they're there, but you know the rhythm is driving you forward. Um, it's only when it's only when they're being show offy or maybe the rhythm's not great, you know, that you start to notice them. But if you've got a solid drummer, if you've got a solid accompanist, it's just beautiful. It's just sublime. And uh, yeah, that's my opinion on it anyway. But um, others might think differently. Um, I can see that we are coming to the end of this month. Um, and I want to leave it on... What do I want to leave it on? Uh, <laughs> I've talked a lot. I've not played very much. And I apologise if people come here to see me play. But we had a lot of questions this month, which is fantastic. A lot of variation as well. So if you um, can't make next month's, um, which will be the first Monday of April, which is going to be Monday the 1st of April, um, then do email me, leave me something on Melnet. I've got my own thread, Ask Melon Box, um, on the teaching and learning thread there. Um, yeah, and obviously always keep up to date with me on Instagram and Facebook and different places. I'm posting a lot at the moment because there's a lot going on and it's all quite varied and really interesting. Also go and check out the More I page for the Alice Wielden story project that we've got going. And you can see our first blog video where we're all talking about the origins of our story and what we're doing. Um, I'm always available for lessons and talking about my pick up and play course. So if you want to know more about starting the Melodian or if you've got a friend that wants to plug them my way, I would really appreciate that. And I think that's about it for now. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for watching and all the comments and questions that have come tonight. I hope that I've sparked some interest. Um, yeah. And I will see you next month or before if uh, we've got something in the diary. Take care. Bye.